previously on Philosophical Reactions. The world's first scientific journal is published. Many diverse subjects are covered, such as a monstrous calf, how to kill rattlesnakes, and lots of comet talk. Hook's Micrography is reviewed. It contains many amazing etchings of microscopic objects, but also several completely untested ideas for mechanisms, including one for grinding lenses. Unbeknownst to Hook, a certain French astronomer has taken offense at this unscientific, unbaconian act of speculation, and sharply phrased letters have been written. Today is June 5th, 1665, and this is episode number 4 of Philosophical Reactions. A relation of some extraordinary tides in the West Isles of Scotland, as it was communicated by Sir Robert Moray. A description of the tides between the islands of North Oost and Harris in the Outer Hebrides. Sir Moray had stayed on the island of Berneray in the Strait, or Fredham, or Frith as he calls it, and saw this unusual phenomenon himself. Normally the flow through here is to the east during flood tide, and back to the west during ebb. However, from four days before the quarter moon, to four days before the next full or new moon, the flow changes. Now it'll flow easterly for twelve straight hours, through flood and ebb, then reverse westerly for the next twelve hours. He goes on to describe another irregularity where the direction of this flow changes depending on the time of year. He wasn't able to witness this himself, however, only being on the island for sixteen or seventeen days. But it was vouched for by the gentleman to whom the island belongs at present, and diverse of his brothers and friends, knowing and discreet persons, and expert in all such parts of sea matters as other islanders commonly are. He ends by saying that, To penetrate into the causes of these strange reciprocations of the tides would require exact descriptions of the situation, shape, and extent of every piece of the adjacent coasts of Oost and Harris, the rocks, sands, shelves, promontories, bays, lakes, depths, and other circumstances which I cannot now set down with any certainty or accurateness, seeing they are to be found in no map. Neither had I any opportunity to survey them, nor do they now occur to my memory, as they did some years ago, when upon occasion I ventured to make a map of this whole firth of Burnery, which not having copied, I cannot adventure to beat it out again. Mazira Zoo's judgment touching the aperture of object glasses and their proportions in respect of the several lengths of telescopes. Our favorite figure in Frenchman is back, and he's going to show up in almost every article in this issue. We start here with a table he has produced, showing that the aperture of telescopes does not scale linearly with the length of the telescope. While unstated, this is in direct contradiction to what Hooke claimed in Micrographia. Instead, Azu says it is in subduplicate ratio the old, more geometrically oriented term for inverse square. The foot he was working with would have been somewhat longer than a modern one, 1.066 feet, or 32.48 centimeters. Lines is a deprecated unit that is one twelfth of an inch, but the point of the chart stands regardless of the units being used. Considerations of Monsieur Zhu upon Mr. Hook's new instrument for grinding of optic glasses. I hope you like petty academic squabbles, because this issue is absolutely full of them. Azu has opinions about Hook's proposed device. Many opinions. He was much surprised when he saw the micrography of Mr. Hook, and found there that his engine was published upon a mere theory, without having made any experiment, though that might have been made with little charge and great speed. Expensive money and time being the only thing that can excuse those who in matter of engines impart their inventions to the public without having tried them to excite others to make trial thereof. His objections are not purely philosophical, however. Hook made some very broad claims for this untried invention, particularly that it could make an objective lens for a telescope of any length or breadth. He even speculated about the size needed for one of a length of 10,000 feet. Azu first points out that this is ridiculous. One can't even get glass blanks of any size made without imperfections such as veins, inclusions, and the adorably named blebs, or bubbles. Hook described the grinding tool as being a hollow cylinder, filled with sand for the grinding. This would form a sphere as the rotating blank was ground against it, in theory. Azu rightly points out that any physical circle in the real world has thickness, and would need to be made very precisely. 
its axis of rotation would need to be kept precisely centered on that of the blank, and as the blank and tool would be constantly changing as they were ground away, that relationship would be extremely difficult to maintain. Furthermore, while maybe this engine could make a lens, could it make the right lens? All the lenses in a telescope need to match each other after all. Hook has spoken of 10,000 foot telescopes, which would need lenses of around 5 feet in diameter. But at that scale, the curve of the lens gets very, very flat. It would only differ from a perfect plane by less than the hundred part of a line, or about 21 microns. To achieve this, the shaft holding the grinding tool would have to be only four arc minutes off the vertical. This was all far beyond the metrological capabilities of the day. Mr. Hook's answer to the Mazura Zoo's considerations in a letter to the publisher of these transactions. Sir, together with my most hearty thanks for the favor you were pleased to do me, in sending me an epitome of what had been, by the ingenious Mazura Zoo, animadverted on a description I had made of an engine for grinding spherical glasses, I thought myself obliged, both for your satisfaction and my own vindication, to return you my present thoughts upon those objections. Though this is written in a very high style, don't be fooled. Hook is pissed. I could wish that this worthy person had rectified my mistakes, not by speculation, but by experiments. This is a stunning rejoinder. Sure, I didn't actually test the device I was proposing to show that it worked, but you didn't test it either to show that it didn't work, so who can really tell who is in the wrong here? Absolutely breathtaking. Moreover, Hook, possibly concerned about his job as the curator of experiments, is very eager to emphasize that this has nothing to do with the Royal Society itself. Either Azu didn't read the introduction where the Society had officially distanced itself from any speculations, or he had not so much of the language wherein I have written as to understand all that was said by me. Straight up trash talk. As for Azu's objections that you can't get large blanks of glass of high enough quality, I think that not now so difficult here in England where I believe is made as good, if not much better, glass for optical experiments than ever I saw come from Venice. Hook did not come here to make friends. He does make a valid retort to the objection of the grinding cylinder not being a perfect geometric circle, though. That is true, perhaps, at first, but before the glass is wrought down to its true figure, the edge of the tool will be worn or ground away, so as that a ring of an inch broad may be made to touch the spherical surface of the glass. He's absolutely right, and this is in fact the reason they were making spherical lenses in the first place. If you rub two surfaces together, they will naturally grind each other away into convex and concave spheres. The difficulty lies in producing the desired radius, but at least the uniformity of the geometry you get more or less for free. Spherical lenses aren't even the best choice for most purposes, but at this point they were all that was possible. This has applications far beyond optics, though. If you do the same grinding technique with three surfaces in turn, they will converge on perfect planes. From there it is a short hop to right angles, and then gauge blocks. This is the foundation of all dimensional metrology, and is arguably responsible for most of modern technology. Looking back at history through the wrong end of a telescope, who was right here? A zoo certainly wasn't wrong that Hook's ideas were untested and impractical. Machine grinding would become common, as can be seen in Diderot's encyclopedia. None of them, to my knowledge anyway, have ever used his ring trick for forming a sphere, and certainly Hook's idea that it would be a simple matter requiring little skill of the operators was absolute bollocks. Machine grinding would slowly improve, but Hook's dream of 10,000 foot long telescopes would never be possible. Progress has slowed as we approach some of the fundamental limitations of glass. The largest lens ever made is only 1.5 meters across, recently finished for the Vera Rubin Observatory currently under construction in Chile. Most telescopes don't even use lenses anymore, but mirrors. Those are easier to make, as only one side has to be perfect, but even now the largest are the two 8.4 meter mirrors in the large binocular telescope in Arizona. The making of these is an astonishing feat of engineering, being cast in a spinning mold over the course of a year, and another three years after that to be ground to their final shape. I would say ground and polished, but at these levels of precision, polishing is absolutely just another form of grinding. At the moment, the trend is to get larger telescopes not by making larger mirrors, but by combining lots of them together. All the next generation telescopes currently under construction are taking this approach, from the Great Magellan with its seven mirrors, all 8.4 meters across, 
to the 492 1.4 meter ones in the 30 meter telescope, to the 798 1.4 meter segments in the appropriately named extremely large telescope. All of these represent a vast increase in our observational abilities as a species. What will we find? We have no idea. Historically, the reasons given for building the next generation of telescopes rarely ends up being the thing that they actually get used for. We are always surprised at what we find. Let's hope that can continue for a long time to come. Okay, back to the action. Of a means to illuminate an object in what proportion one pleaseth, and of the distances requisite to burn bodies by the sun. Continuing from Azu's communication, this is a short piece on his work to estimate the brightness of the sun as seen from other planets. He accomplishes this with lenses scaled to their distances from the sun. According to these experiments, he says that the sunlight on Mercury would not be enough to burn bodies, and that it would be enough to read by on Saturn, comparable to the light here on Earth on an overcast day. As a way to test this, he has given instructions to certain persons, gone to travel in hot countries, to try by means of great burning glasses, with how much less aperture they will burn there than here, to know from thence whether there be more light there than here. This is a really neat way to quantize an amount of light, lacking any better tools. How would you try to measure such a thing, if you couldn't just buy a light meter online? The article also has a very early example of the Goldilocks zone concept. Azu speculates that the Earth would have to be seven times closer to the Sun than it is, in order for us to be burned by it. A further account touching Signor Campani's book and performances about optic glasses. Azu also included a review of Giuseppe Campani's new treatise. This included yet more objections to lens making, this time Campani apparently claiming they could be made with just a lathe and not a grinding mold, but no details are given. Most of the article is about Campani's observations of Saturn, particularly as they relate to Huygens' hypothesis, that is, the idea that there is a ring around Saturn. We take that for granted now, but it is a genuinely bizarre thing, particularly if one was still coming out of the intellectual miasma of the heavens being the realm of perfect spheres. Huygens had first proposed this in 1655, and obviously it was still seen as conjectural ten years later. They both agree with the hypothesis, but, not surprisingly, Azu questions many of Campani's observations. After some discussion of Jupiter, it ends in commentary on the state of Copernicism in general. Hence, he also taketh occasion to intimate that we need not scruple to conclude that if these two planets have moons wheeling about them, as our Earth hath one that moves about it, the conformity of these moons with our moon does prove the conformity of our Earth with those planets, which carrying away their moons with themselves do turn about the sun. Indeed, we should not even worry too much about censure of the Church, quoting a Vatican official that the moving of the sun could be accepted if fully and definitively proved. Accordingly, Whence this author concludes that the said Jesuit assuring us that the Inquisition hath not absolutely declared that those scripture places are to be understood literally, seeing that the Church may make a contrary declaration, no man ought to scruple to follow the hypothesis of the Earth's motion, but only forbear to maintain it in public till the prohibition be called in. That would happen almost a hundred years later, in 1758. Signor Campani's answer, and Monsieur Azu's animadversions thereon. Now it's time for some back and forth between Campani and Azu. Campani didn't say that he was viewing the shadows of Saturn and its ring, but the rims of those objects, which have different brightnesses and thus stand out. In response, Mr. Azu does so far acquiesce that he only wishes that his own glasses would show him those differences. Azu disagreed with Campani's measurements of the shape of the ring. Campani replieth that the glasses of Monsieur Azu show not all the particulars that his do, and therefore are unfit for determining the true figure. Monsieur Azu rejoins that he is displeased at his being destitute of better glasses, but that it will be very hard for the future to convince Campani touching the proportion of the ring. Ah, the noble pursuit of truth! An account of Mr. Richard Lower's newly published Vindication of Dr. Willis's Diatriba de Fibribus. A short book review, asking such questions as, whether a fever does consist in an effervescence of blood, and if so, of what kind? Whether there be a nervous and nutritious juice? It has also inquired into what the uses of the lungs are in hot animals, and many other such material disquisitions are to be found in this small but very ingenious and learned treatise. A note touching a relation, 
inserted in the last transactions. And finally, an update to the rattlesnake story from the last issue. It should have been added that the gentleman there mentioned did affirm that, in those places where the wild pennyroyal or dittany grows, no rattlesnakes are observed to come. Still no mention of the purported anti-venin properties of the plant originally reported in the Royal Society meeting, oddly enough. And that's it for Philosophical Transactions, Issue 4. Tune in next month for Mining Tips, Sericulture, and the introduction of our new favorite death metal band, Monstrous Head!